It's a good idea. Whether I, again, whether what I perceive as good is actually good, or, or I perceive it as good, is one thing. But I have faith that everything happens for a reason. Trust is a little bit deeper. Trust says, I have absolute certainty. I have absolute certainty and conviction that God is going to make things good. And not only good in the grand scheme of things, but good in a way that I can relate to the good. We understand the importance of positive thinking. However, what does Judaism say about how our positive thoughts actually affect the world at large? How does it affect reality? The secret, as we discussed earlier, holds by a concept called the law of attraction. The idea that thoughts influence reality. The secret, the secret talks about a universal intelligence that responds to our desires and our positive visualizations. If you really want something and you truly believe in it, posits the book, it'll happen. Now, first of all, whenever academia or the secular world says the universe or the universal intelligence, what they really mean is God. They can't say God, because that's something for the theologians to discuss. But what they really mean, universal intelligence, the universe, is a sort of divine essence to reality as we know it. What we call God. In the God world, in the world where God is interacting with us and watching over us, I can't say that the Torah perspective agrees 100% with the law of attraction. Because any whims or cravings or desire that we have, God's just going to grant it to us or it's going to appear out of thin air? No. However, there are some fascinating parallels that we're going to explore. How does, how does my thoughts, how do our thoughts create reality, change the fiber of reality? It's very much related to an idea in Judaism on the idea of trust in God. Trust in God. Trust in Hebrew, and as it's talked about in the philosophical works, is called bitachon. Bitachon means trusting in God. Now, it's different from a concept that we know called emuna, which is faith in God. What's the difference between faith, emuna, and trust, bitachon? So many people think that, one, that bitachon, trust, is just a more, intense, a more intense feeling of faith. One is faith, and one is really, really, really strong faith called trust. <laughs> bitachon is really, really strong emuna, in other words. It's a little bit different. To sum it up, emuna, faith, if we were going to encapsulate the entire idea, maybe to a sentence or two, it's the idea that we believe, we believe that everything is guided in the grand scheme of things. Whether I perceive something as good or that I perceive something as not good, I believe, I have emuna, I have faith that everything has a reason, although I may not see the good in it at the moment, everything has sort of a reason. This is something that obviously breeds serenity, because whatever happens is meant to be. It's a good idea. Whether I, again, whether what I perceive as good is actually good, or, or I perceive it as good, is one thing. But I have faith that everything happens for a reason. Trust is a little bit deeper. Trust says, I have absolute certainty. I have absolute certainty and conviction that God is going to make things good. And not only good in the grand scheme of things, but good in a way that I can relate to the good. We have it, we're presented, in other words, we're presented with a certain situation. Person goes through a challenge, uh, somebody you know, loses their job, for example, or is in a transition in life. A person with bitachon, 
with true bitachon, which is not easy to do. No one's saying that. But someone with true trust, true bitachon, says it has a certainty that I believe, I know that God is going to do good for me, and not only good in a way that is good in the grand scheme, but a good in a way that I can relate to. There's a wonderful biblical narrative that really demonstrates the dynamics of trust and how it works, and further, how our thoughts create the reality in which we live. Many people, many of us, are probably familiar with Moses in Egypt. And Moses, one day he encounters an Egyptian beating on an Israelite. And what does the Torah tell us that Moses does when he encounters this? He kills the Egyptian. Following that occurrence, Moses then finds two Israelites, two Jews fighting. That happens? Two Jews fighting? He found two Jews fighting. And Moses goes over, hey guys, what's going on? You're trying to break it up. And so one of them says to him, what do they say? You're going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian? The Torah says something very shocking after that. It says like this, Moses became frightened. He said, indeed, the matter has become known. And right away afterwards, the Torah tells us, Pharaoh heard of the incident and sought to slay Moses. So Moses becomes frightened. The, 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 the account, the story had become known. And Pharaoh, then it says after that, Pharaoh heard of the incident and sought to slay Moses. Why does the Torah tell us about Moses' emotional response? Moses became frightened. It's not something typical in the Torah to talk to, talk to us about our forefathers' emotional um, issues or struggles that they're going through, how they felt. Abraham was happy then. Right? Isaac felt nice. <laughs> Moses was scared. But when the Torah goes out of its way to describe something, it's meant as a lesson. First of all, it's a normal reaction. Wouldn't you be scared? Wouldn't the normal person, wouldn't even a great person be scared? It's a normal reaction. Why does the Torah have to tell us that? We could, we could probably assume that he'd be scared. So everything in the Torah is meant, every word, every letter, and even every crown on every letter is meant as an eternal lesson for all Jews in all places at all times. Why, why does the Torah, what's the eternal lesson that we're being taught by the Torah telling us that Moses was scared and then subsequently being taught that Pharaoh heard? In order to get the answer, we're going to preface with a short idea. The idea is brought by the Rambam, the famed medieval sage Maimonides, in his magnum opus of philosophy, the Mor Nevuchim, the Guide for the Perplexed. He says as follows, the human mind is intimately cre uh, connected with the active intellect, the divine intellect. Divine, this is a divine attribute independent of the human being. Our thoughts are influenced by this active intellect, and it also attracts energy from it. Meaning that there's a, a give and take in what happens in our mind and what happens in the world. The Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, explains the juxtaposition of these verses in the Torah and tells us a tremendous lesson for our daily life. Again, the verses that are juxtaposed, Moses becomes frightened, and he says, indeed, the matter has become known. And then right away, Pharaoh heard of the incident and sought to slay Moses. The Rebbe says, these verses are juxtaposed and the Torah indicates Moses' fear for the following reason. Moses' fear, his negative outlook, his thought process, is what caused Pharaoh to hear. Meaning, because of the fact that he became scared, the world became a scary place. Because of the fact that that moment, 
that there was a certain lacking in trust, a lacking in certainty that things are going to be perfect and things are going to be good in a way that I can see them as good, the world became a scary place. Because Moses was scared, because he was frightening, the world became a frightening place. Now the assurance that our thoughts and that God is going to do good things in a way that I can perceive them as good is not an easy task. We're filled all the time with doubts, rightfully so. We're human beings and we live in a world where things challenge the way that we think. But when a person does it, the thought actually becomes the conduit to draw down God's blessings. It, the thought itself, the perfect trust that we have, becomes the utensil, becomes the vehicle that allows God's bounty, God's blessing to reveal itself, to show itself in the world. So through us thinking positively, through us thinking and having trust that things are going to be good, the reality will come, and that is through the conduit of the thought. Even to the undeserving, even to somebody who, based on their actions or their day-to-day -day life, may not be worthy of God's bounty. Just the fact that they have the trust at that moment, with perfect certainty, creates the reality, creates the vehicle for that blessing to take place in the world. The Tzemach Tzedek, the third Rebbe of Chabad, was approached by a person who had a severely ill child. And he told him a very beautiful phrase. He said, think good, and it will be good. Tracht good, it's signed good. Think good, think positive, and it's going to be positive. Now the Tzemach Tzedek wasn't informing, giving him a pat on the back and saying, you know, think good, every, life's good. It wasn't wishful thinking. But he said, through your positive thoughts, it will influence that reality will actually be good. Anyone who's dabbled a little bit in quantum physics finds that we find a similar thing in the development of information, how, how the research is, is beginning to show itself. And that was something that was really brought out and publicized by The Secret. Nobel Prize winning physicist John Wheeler said the observer is essential in the universe to exist. The observer is essential for the universe to exist. Another Nobel laureate, Eugene Wigner, says that the conscious observer, specifically a person with free will, is necessary to act on quantum particles to bring them into a state of real existence. Meaning that existence doesn't exist until a free-willed being observes it and wills it into reality. Very similar to what we're talking about here. Just by the thought, just by thinking positively, thinking in the right term of things, it makes, it creates the reality that uh, is good, is desirable. 